Let's talk to Malcolm Graham Wood. He is an oil analyst at Melky's blog. Very good morning to you, Malky. Hi, miss. Now, just for a change, me and you aren't going to talk about the bucket list. Yep. Um, I think it's about time we talked about <coughs> Brent crude. 13 down mm. days, broken the 50-day, 200-day moving average. The headlines have quickly moved from $100 a barrel to sort of sell, sell, <laughs> sell. Um, <coughs> what on earth is going on? Uh, well, not all of us believed $100 uh, dollars a barrel, uh, I, to be fair. But, but um, actually what's happening is that uh, we've got the situation where uh, in the, I mean, we're 20% off, so we're properly in a, in a bear market, as it were. Um, and interestingly, it's 66 for Brent and 56, 60, whatever it is, for West Texas. West Texas, um, the December option expired last night. So we're now, you know, interestingly into January crudes. So what happened was... Uh, the Iran situation was, was what everything was leading up to. Yep. November the 4th, sanctions come on in full. But actually what had happened was they'd started to reduce production a bit before then. And so, if you remember, people like Trump and so on were saying, please make sure the oil market is well supplied with crude oil. And the, Ra the Russians and the Saudis in particular did that well before they had a little meeting to discuss it. So they increased production quite substantially. And then come November the 4th, when they announced, the US announced the waivers, there were more waivers than expected. So more people are allowed to still buy Iranian crude. So you have a situation whereby you know, the market started to tip off and, and they didn't like that and, they, uh, and it came down. The fourth quarter is always the tightest quarter of the year. Uh, but actually, given that that was the case and people knew that we were well enough supplied, people started to look forward. Um, we had non-APEC supply, which is increasing in particular from the US. And of course, um, the, the, the money market, or the speculators, as some people call them, people who play in the uh, long and the short positions in, in, in the crude, direct in the crude market, uh, have had a huge influence in the last uh, two months. The net length in NSL, net speculative length, has more than halved, and the and the short the net short positions have tripled in both West Texas and in in Brent. So, uh, and that would be professional money, right? Oh yeah, that, yeah, that's professional money. It's hedge funds and professional money. So you know, you literally, I mean, the short position in uh, in in Brent has gone up to 109 from 30. And similar number for West Texas, and 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 the, and the long position, you know, have, have gone from 1,100 million barrels of crude to 380. Right. So yeah. you know, we've you know, they've taken those positions. Now, funny enough, those those positions, you know, they can go short as long as you like. But actually, when you get to the stage where if anything starts to look like it's going to pick up. Uh, those people will be buying back those short positions pretty quickly. And it's all down to December the 6th now. We're all rolling a sort of dice on what's going to happen. The OPEC meeting, or OPEC plus as it's called now, because Russia joined in and so on, is December the 6th, which is only, what, two weeks tomorrow or something. Um, and, uh, and when that happens, what we'll see is... Uh, enormous amount of pressure. This is the most important OPEC meeting for two years. If you remember in October 2016, having seen $27 for crude oil in February of that year, uh, the OPEC got together, got together with the non-OPEC suppliers and said, you know, we may not like the fact that America are producing so much oil, but there isn't anything we can do about it. There's no point in trying to play, go for the sort of market you know, market share argument, yep. we have to cut production. And it made sense because if you cut, if they all cut their production by 10%, then their, they, their monthly checks go up by 20%. And they did. You can probably remember that they, that they went up, you know, very dramatically. And then the longer term chart um, shows that this little uh, nip that we've had back, albeit 20%, in, in, the, in the scope since 2016, when the, you know, the, the February 2016 uh, low of 27, uh, is actually only you know, not too big. And, and for oil companies, of course, they spent the time in 2014 to 2016 and then 2017 cutting their costs. Yep. I mean, huge amount yep. of costs. I mean, these costs are 50, 60, 70% down in three years. Uh, I spoke to an American company uh, a couple of months ago who say, you know, that at, uh, that at $75, you know, they were making much more money than they ever were at 115 uh, because they will cut their costs. So, okay, Brent is $66 this morning, um, but, you know, most people do their numbers on 40 And so, you know, the fact that it's down 20% is big, but it's, uh, and it means that it makes a difference, but it's not, it's not so bad. So, 
the, the, the reason this, this uh, OPEC meeting is so crucial is they have to cut production. Now, already we've seen the Saudis last week saying that they were going to cut by half a million barrels a day in December as part of an all-round cut of a million. A million certainly won't be enough, but then they said it would probably be 1.4 million. Um, I think that they will say that they're going to come away with a, a minimum of 1.4 million barrels a day cut uh, across the board, and if not more. And Russia, who have been a little bit not playing the game in the last two or three weeks, uh, but then that's what Russians do. They sometimes have other things on the agenda, and they like to... You know, but but they, they know that it's most important for them as well. So it's very much up to the, the players in uh, in. So Vienna. how would you position yourself ahead of that December the 6th? Okay, is it yeah. a buy, sell or hold, or is it basically time to rest? Uh, well, I wouldn't be short crude going out to that meeting because I think that, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, you could be short. It's a hell of a position to be. If they come away without an agreement, the next next stop is $50. Is it really? Um, uh, so, but it's a brave man who does that because I think that, uh, I don't think there's any chance that the Saudis think that they will be able to get away with, you know, trying to get market share anymore. Yep. You know, that's just a downward spiral. So they must know that the only thing to do is to, is to cut production. So, you know, it, it may not be a great result if they say, well, we're going to do 1.4 million barrels and reassess at the end of the first quarter or something like that, because uh, the market will probably say that's not quite enough. Uh, but you've got to bear in mind that actually spare capacity is quite thin, you know, and certainly, you know, when, with, with, uh, with the, the way the market is going at the moment, you know, you don't need anything spectacular going wrong. I mean, we've covered... Uh, Venezuela going wrong, and people, and we've covered Iran cutting their production, uh, but that's partly because everyone's increased their production at the moment. Uh, ironically, Nigeria is producing well, so is Libya and so is Angola, but any of those could could have a problem, which would would cause the the capacity thing to come back into play. So longer term, I still think that the upside is uh, outweighs the the downside. Um, and companies, you know, the market has really hit oil and gas companies very hard over yeah. the, you know, one or two companies that have been doing incredibly well, still producing really good operational announcements, you know, like Premier the other day. Yet these shares, are, most of them have halved, and uh, and there's no reason for that at all. Uh, and they're still producing, you know, at, at $66, $67. Some of these guys have still got fantastic revenue, uh, throwing off cash, and in very good, and very good nick. And one thing that happens when that when that ha particular thing happens is that bigger oil companies work out that the oil it's cheaper to drill for oil in the stock markets than it is to go out and do it themselves. So they'll go and buy companies that have right. got some decent uh, assets in. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a bit of that at the moment. But um, so December the sixth, really crucial. Spare capacity. Watch out on a Friday when you see the numbers coming out from the because they announce the speculative positions every Friday. Um, Worth watching that, you know. Even worth watching. I mean, the gas price, ironically, in particular in the states, has been very strong. They had their first cold snap of the year. I put my jacket and hat on this morning for the first time. Boom, boom. So actually, what we see is we see something like a cold snap can make uh, certainly make uh, gas demand go up, um, and and that means you get a slight change in the inventory position because you know throughout the summer the oil price was high because inventories were going down all the time. Uh, OPEC make a big point about saying they want inventories to be below the five-year average. And uh, and in the last two or three months, since we've moved away from the summer and we're moving back to maintenance, getting ready for more distillates and heavy oil and, and uh, heating and that sort of stuff, um, uh, inventories have gone up again. I would expect to see those inventories start to fall again. So I'm not, I'm not too worried at the moment. It is a 20% fall. Um, but um, as I say, the long-term chart tells you that's not the end of the world. And I think we could, you know, if I had to guess, I'd be buying it off off these levels rather than selling it. But two weeks on Thursday in Vienna is going to be one hell of a couple of days. Understood. Now, okay, we run out of time. As always, lovely to see you. Thank you very much.